I would like now to prepare our audience for our, let's say, small highlight of the day, the high-level panel on transport and, uh, eco and sustainable growth. And I would like to invite you first, do you think that it is possible to decouple economic growth from transport emissions? I invite you to answer to these questions while we are running the high-level panel. That is already waiting behind the scenes for us. And with this, I would like to hand over to Iman Abu Bakr, who will be our host from WRI Africa with this exciting panel. Now, over to you, Iman. We are really excited to see what's coming for us. Thank you very much, Stephanie. Um, ladies and gentlemen and distinguished guests, welcome to the high-level panel discussion on transport policies for sustainable growth. My name is Iman Abu Bakr, and I'm the Urban Mobility Project Manager for the World Resource Institute Africa, and I'll be your moderator for this session. Since the morning, we've had sessions on active mobility, electric mobility, priority transport corridors, and national transport and climate strategies. Now we'll be bringing it all together to discuss how cities and countries can transition to a sustainable, low-carbon transport sector, what type of investments and policies are needed to set the transport and energy sector on a low-carbon development path, and how collaborations among African countries with international partners can support climate-compatible growth of the transport sector. As we all know, COP27 is only six months away, and in order to meet the global and national commitments, we know we need policies and investments that will advance the sustainable transport sec sector, which is an essential pillar for Africa's economic and social development. We hope to explore the potential alignment of transport and climate policy uh, from an African perspective. To share their experiences and insights on this, I have with me today an incredible set of speakers and panelists. We have a slight change uh, to the program, so we will first start with a short introductory speech uh, from the Ethiopian Minister of Transport and Logistics, Her Excellency Dagmarit Mogas, and then move on to our panel discussion. Minister Mogas, welcome, and thank you for being here with us today. Let me give you the floor to open this session for us. Thank you very much, Iman Abubakar. It's a pleasure to be here as well. Uh, dear organizers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm pleased to join you in this year's Transport and Climate Change Week panel session to exchange ideas of transport policies for global sustainable growth. It's known that climate change is the critical challenge of our planet, as it is uh, disturbing the nature's balance and posing risks to human and all other forms of life. The result, creating sustainable and safe environment has as primary agenda of the world. It's also important that the transport sector as one of the major contributors to the climate change, noting its significant contribution to this challenge, several global initiatives are being implemented to establish sustainable transport and logistics system. And a number of countries are introducing the issue of sustainable and safe mobility in their national policies. Global economies are also investing in technologies that introduce free transport vehicles. If we stay in a business as usual scenario, Africa will be one of the most vulnerable regions in the world by the consequences of climate change. With this understanding, my country, Ethiopia, has been leading this global effort by introducing a climate resilient green economy back in the years. We have also shown our commitment to international agreements including the recently ratified Paris Agreement. Participants, ladies and gentlemen, up, uh, our updated national determined contribution, determined contribution represents a clear progression in ambition with 68.8 emission reduction target by 2030 from the business as usual scenario, which also seeks to inspire others to increase their contribution to this collective effort. Ethiopia's nationally determined contribution is built on its climate resilience and green economy strategy and set out an ambitious development trajectory that aims to reach lower level uh, middle income status. The climate resilience and green economy strategy is continuing and will, will continue to be one of the key strategic pillars of the national 10 year development plan of our country. When we see specifically to the transport and logistics sector's contribution to the unconditional pathway to 
foresees to a relative reduction of 25% of sectoral business as usually mentioned in 2030. Our national transport sector policies, both transport policy and logistics policy, consider the issue of sustainable mobility as a strategic focus agenda. And in addition, in our 10-year perspective plan, we have set a goal that will help us to achieve our commitment and the revised nationally determined contribution. Ethiopia's transport and logistics sector has exemplary experience in developing sustainable transport infrastructure and undertaking its operations. We proudly say that we are the first in Africa in building and commencing the operation of modern electrified standard uh, railway uh, line, standard gauge railway line, and the 767 kilometers, the Addis Ababa, Djibouti standard gauge railway line, has a Horn of Africa's link to the world, which commenced its operation few years back and is fully energized by renewable electric electricity from the hydropower dams that we have in our country. We are also undertaking the development of our Sharagabea and Haragabea Makale electrified standard gauge railway projects which will expand the size of the network to that of 1,400 kilometers in the coming 10 years. I mean, in the coming few years, and even in the coming 10 years, we have planned to scale up the size of the network to that of 4,000 kilometers by adding a number of electrified standard gauge railway lines that are strategically diversify the seaport access that we have as a country. We are also encouraging the assembly and manufacturing of electric vehicles in our uh, automotive strategy. Currently, we have two manufacturing companies already launched the assembly of electric vehicles. Promoting the adoption of electric vehicles is one of our priorities, and this has been manifested in our sector standard perspective plan as well, which we have planned to introduce more than 146,000 electric vehicles or buses and automobiles in general in our streets. We are also closely working with our stakeholders and more importantly, with the private sector to realize this vision. And we believe that as a government, it's not going to be only the government's duty to carry out such kind of action. And we are very much determined to support the private sector in this regard. Appropriate incentive mechanisms for the adoption of electric vehicles are in the making which will help us to boost the adoption of, uh, the adoption of this electric uh, mobility or electric vehicles relatively in a faster period of time. And in parallel with the promotion of adopting electric vehicles, we are also working to have the necessary charging infrastructure in our cities. We have been very successful to launch electric vehicles charging infrastructure very recently. This effort will be uh, continuing as well in a more aggressive manner. Currently, we are implementing a measure to discourage the use of fossil fuel for vehicles by removing the subsidy for the importation of fuel. Furthermore, we have launched the implementation of non-motorized transport strategy, which promotes walking and cycling uh, as alternative mode of transport, majorly in our uh, urban centers, which we already identified. They are about 69 in number, and we are working aggressively on the cities and will continue to the other uh, level of cities that we have in different parts of uh, our country. Participants, ladies and gentlemen, it's my strong belief that our journey, our joint effort collectively will create a sustainable and safe transport for the future generation. Especially African nations shall devote themselves and invest their time money and all resources that they have in safe and sustainable kind of mobility in all their endeavors. However, this cannot be realized only because we wish to change the current scenario. We have to clearly indicate in our policies, strategies, and plans that creating sustainable environments through sustainable mobility is our focal agenda. Furthermore, we have to mobilize all our partners stakeholders to join hands in implementing and identified in our already identified targets as we cannot make it alone as a government, both technically and financially. Our world is changing fast, especially 
the environment we live in has suffered due to our irresponsible actions. Unless we wake up today and live in harmony with our environment, we may not be able to see the future in the way that we all aspire to do so. Therefore, we have to mainstream the agenda of sustainability in our respective sectors. Sustainable and safe mobility will take us to the cleaner and safer world of the future. I hope this panel will provide us an opportunity to discuss the challenges we are experiencing and to share the best experiences that helped us to tackle the challenge. I wish a successful and fruitful event. Thank you very much. Doing and setting the scene for us on the importance of sustainable transport for sustainable growth. Thank you again for joining us and we wish you a wonderful day. Um, we will now move into our panel discussion. Uh, before we get started, let me introduce our distinguished panelists. So I'll start with Dr. Mohammed Khalil, who's the General Manager of Ministry of Housing and New Urban Communities for Egypt. Mr. Usman Obafami Shitabe, Deputy Director of Corporate and Investment Planning from Lagos Metropolitan Area Transport Authority, known as LAMATA. Mr. Jafar Saluhi, Chief of the Division of Technical Studies, um, and finally, Mr. Fitzurhan Zagai, Advisor to the Minister of Transport and Logistics of Ethiopia. Welcome and thank you all for being here with us today. Uh, so with that, um, let me start with my first question for you, Dr. Khalil. Um, poor air quality is a key driver for Egypt and specifically Greater Cairo to reduce transport emissions. And this is becoming common for many African cities, as we've heard uh, from Minister Mogus as well from Ethiopia. Uh, the government of Egypt has plans to initially deploy 100 electric public transport buses and also to launch an electric vehicle industry master plan. What can electric mobility do for African countries, for CO2 emissions and beyond? Dr. Khalil, over to you. Yes, uh, thank you uh, for this uh, introduction. Uh, actually, as uh, most of us know, uh, transport sector uh, constitutes almost uh, 14 percentage of the total global uh, greenhouse gases uh, emissions. Uh, for sure, uh, this percentage is going up and down and different from uh, locality and from uh, country to another. Therefore, uh, transport sector uh, in general play a very considerable uh, role uh, in uh, the issue of the uh, climate change and the global warming. Behind CO2 uh, mitigations, uh, indeed, the transport sector play many uh, significant role, uh, particularly uh, e-mobility uh, contributing uh, in a significant way to the sustainability and scalability of uh, the African uh, countries. And when we are speaking about sustainability and scalability, we are speaking in terms of micro and macro scale, not only for environmental uh, issue and aspects, but also for uh, economics and social uh, aspects as well. And of course, this, uh, uh, this is in alignment with the expansion of the uh, renewable uh, energy uh, sources uh, all over the world and particularly in the uh, African uh, countries. Uh, moreover, uh, one of the ultimate uh, goals of uh, the next COP27 is to address the potential uh, alignment of uh, transport and climate policies. This is a very crucial uh, issue and one of the cornerstones for the success of the adaptation and mitigation of the uh, challenges of the climate change and the global uh, warming. And for sure, uh, this will be addressed from the African and global uh, perspectives as well. Back to you. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed Khalil. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll get back to the, the issues around electric mobility, but I think that that's really impressive. And um, electric mobility is definitely a key part of the transition to a low carbon transport sector. But we know that's only a piece of the puzzle, especially in African cities where motorization is relatively low, but rapidly increasing. There are many opportunities to avoid car-centric car growth. So in addition to advancing electric mobility, 
there's a critical need for the system change, as we've heard from previous sessions and from our, our speakers already. So for to have this integrated multimodal transport sector that really prioritizes accessibility and safety um, through promotion of mass transit and active mobility. So uh, if I could go to our, speak, our speaker from La Mata, um, who's, you know, La Mata is working on moving 18 million people each day. And we know Lagos is also developing its 2040 transport master plan. So could you tell us a little bit about the master plan? What role uh, will sustainable low carbon transport play in this master plan? And what are its key projects? Over to you. Sorry, uh, we we can't hear you. Um. My Sorry, my wife was up. So yes. thank you very much for having me. And uh, my name is Obafemi Shitabe. I'm representing the managing director who is unavoidably absent. Um, very well, you're absolutely right. The ultimate goal of the Lagos State Government transport sector policy and strategy is to is to establish a sustainable integrated multimodal public transport system that befits the mega city of Lagos. So the key word there is sustainable. Um, prior to the establishment of La Mata and with the huge congestion and general deterioration of the environment and uh, a lack of an effective public transport delivery, the whole system was in chaos. So obviously the first thing was to establish the master plan and start building mass rapid transit systems and get cars off the road. So we've, we have um, a combination of bus rapid transit systems, light rail transit systems, and even non-motorized transport uh, in order to try to decongest the road to reduce emissions uh, from greenhouse gases and uh, sort of improve um, uh, mo mobility and the health of the population. So um, the uh, strategic trust of master plan, which was uh, which we have right now, will be extended in 20, um, to 2040. It's actually 2032 right now. So we have a combination of mass rapid systems in rail, bus, and even ferry services. The whole idea is to encourage and improve public transport and non-motorized transport. With regard to non-motorized transport, we worked with the United Nations Environmental Program and the International Transport Development Policy over the last four or five years, and where we have developed a non-motorized transport policy, which has been approved by the government. And uh, we've got development partners such as GIZ helping us with a uh, with a pilot project, which we just completed on NMT. So the way forward, obviously, uh, apart from the fact that the traffic, the transport dynamics in Lagos actually extend beyond. Lagos State itself, it goes into the neighboring state of Ogun State. What we're trying to do is ensure we can implement mass rapid transit systems, non-motorized transport, and then recently even electric mobility. We are, we're, working on, we're working with the World Bank right now on um, how we can also develop electric mobility. It's actually kicked off. We had a kickoff meeting um, um, about last month, and um, the study is, is going to commence, has already commenced, uh, to see how we can encourage uh, uh, electric mobility. I also want to point out the fact that um, at least 30, at least 35 percent of uh, mobility in, in Lagos is by walking. So that's why we needed to address that that issue and to make sure that uh, those who commit to walk either uh, by first last first mile or last mile uh, uh, can do so in a very a convenient man and a very seamless man. Thank you very much. Thank you, um, Dr. Mr. Shitabe. Um, so I, I think those are great points in terms of looking at the bigger picture, looking at the different moving parts, including um, you know, electric mobility in addition to mass transit, NMT, um, and then really a focus on what majority of the of the citizens or residents rely on, which is walking. Uh, so I think these it's it's very impressive what Lagos is doing and just shows the importance of planning and setting targets. Uh, so just to go into uh, to maybe Mr. Jafar Saluhi from Morocco. 
And if you can share your experiences um, on how uh, how Morocco is, is looking at transitioning to be a, a sustainable, low carbon transport sector and how this will support social and economic development in Africa. Mr. Jafar, over to you. Hello, I would like to thank you first for inviting me to take part in this high panel discussion on the topic of transition of the transport sector and uh, the development of uh, a new structure of transport in Africa. Uh, in order to answer to your question, Morocco has committed itself to develop uh, sustainably, especially the transport sector. We have a national contribution that has been developed. The first uh, report on NDCs uh, was published in 2016 and was submitted to the Secretariat of the United Nations on climate change. And it contains a set of um, initiatives to mitigate climate change in the sector of transport especially. This action on the side of Morocco has been especially important because we have uh, increased our efforts in the scope of the activities of the United Nations and uh, Morocco's contribution include 61 different actions. 14 are unconditional and uh, 26 are conditional in order to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions in the next years. In the context of these activities, the transport sector contributes uh, considerably to the mitigation of climate change and greenhouse gases. It's seven actions that have been defined. Two of them are unconditional in nature, uh, five are conditional, and this includes projects that help to extend our tramway network in the city of Casablanca and the improvement of uh, the environmental standards for cars in order to bring down emission levels. It is especially transport uh, fleets or car fleets that need to change. We want to reduce CO2 emissions for both passenger cars and light commercial vehicles. Morocco is has committed itself to bring down its uh, greenhouse gas emission levels in the scope of these different agreements. Regarding the percentage rates, this global effort uh, by 2030 of the transport sector, a reduction of 8% here, Morocco wants to reduce its emission levels in the transport sector by 45% in the same period. And for the transport sector, we account for about 5% of all the industrial sectors that also contribute to the reduction of CO2 emissions. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Mr. Jafar. Um, I think that it's 45% uh, reduction in all the efforts that Morocco is, is doing to reduce emissions uh, is, is exemplary and uh, many, many African countries can follow suit. So thank you for sharing with us that experience uh, and, and being one of the, the key um, countries that has submitted uh, a 
one of the few NDCs in line with the 1.5 uh, uh, Celsius target of the Paris Agreement. So we've spoken a lot about plans and commitments from countries. So I want to shift the discussion a little bit to implementation and maybe hear from you, Mr. Fitzumberhan, on how governments can effectively advance sustainable and low carbon transport and what is needed to translate these policies to impact on the ground. As we've heard from Minister Mogus, there's a lot of activities that are happening and lots of momentum. So if you can share with us um, some of the key lessons lessons learned and uh, how we can translate our policies uh, to, to implementation. Over to you, Mr. Fitzumbran. Uh, thank you, Iman. Uh, again, my name is Fitzumbran, advisor to the Ministry of Transport and Logistics of Ethiopia. Uh, it's a very interesting question, Iman, which you raised. I think, uh, as Excellency has outlined in her opening remarks, our ministry in particular and uh, our government in general is advancing on the implementation of uh, sustainable mobility options for Ethiopia in different fronts, be it on the non-motorized transport options or be it on the electric mobility as well. Just to start with, uh, what we have done is we have laid a really a good foundation by institutionalizing uh, the required policies. So we have uh, embarked on our transport policy a year ago where we have crafted it in a way that it is more climate sensitive and uh, we give due attention for the issue of sustainability as well. So below that, uh, we have also worked with our international and local stakeholders and developed uh, our national non-motorized transport strategy, which is under implementation, in which uh, most of the focus is on advancing working and cycling initiatives across the country. I was listening my brother in Lagos, he was mentioning that 35% or so of the, the, the residents of Lagos are using working as a predominant mode of transport. So if you see the issue in our capital, Ethiopia, uh, more than 55% of uh, our people use working as a predominant uh, mode of transport, which means a lot of work needs to be done to provide adequate infrastructure for working and also including cycling which is our ministry's priority or focus area. And now recently we have uh, also embarked on our 10 years perspective plan, where we have again emphasized the need for sustainable transport options in all modes of transport. And Excellency was mentioning that we are advancing with the uh, railway transport, which is powered by hydroelectric power, because hydroelectric is a predominant source of energy for our country and more than 98% of the source is sourced from hydroelectric power. And we have also enormous potential uh, of generating electricity from renewable energy sources. So we will combine our uh, nature given uh, renewable energy resources and to utilize it for the uh, transport and logistics infrastructures as well. So we will advance with the expanding our railway network from the existing up to uh, our target is to reach it to 4,000 in the coming uh, 10 years period. And uh, we have also given a due emphasis on the adoption and introduction of electric mobility in our country. And as mentioned by Your Excellency, uh, we have a plan of introducing more than 146,000 electric vehicles in our streets, including electric buses, automobiles, and three-wheelers and two-wheelers as well. So we believe that there is a need for a stronger policy instrument to advance this. And importantly, in addition to the policy, there is a need for a strong government commitment, which we have both at the top level and below our leadership. And there is also a need for a stringent uh, enforcement mechanism. For example, now we are now putting a stringent mechanism to uh, limit the, uh, the importation of older vehicles by introducing a very stringent excise tax law. This uh, will have a much better contribution to our uh, greenhouse gas emissions related to the transport sector. So more importantly, we have to combine the policy, the commitment of the leadership, and also there is a need to have a strong partnership with local institutions, international partners, with the academia and others. So combining and collecting all this dot, we believe that uh, it will be achievable to transform from uh, polluted type of uh, transport and logistics infrastructure and uh, utilities to that of uh, sustainable mobility. Thank you. Over to you, Amos. Thank you, Mr. Fusul Burhan Sakai. So I think 
that's a great segue into the, the next set of questions that I have uh, for the panelists, which is really looking at the connection of the of these dots, as, as you were saying, and focusing a lot on the financing and, and the stakeholder engagement and the collaboration that's needed for us to, to be able to move the needle. So um, just, you know, uh, Mr. Shitabe, if you, a critical part of implementation of sustainable transport policies is financing. Um, African cities and countries will invest billions of dollars in forthcoming years to support the economic growth. And considering climate change and Africa's need for adaptation, how will this impact the transport sector? And what are some of the most urgent recommendations? Uh, we can't hear you, Mr. Shitabe. Oh, Maybe. So it's oh, sorry. <laughs> perfect. Can you hear me now? Can you yes, hear me? we can. Yes, okay. please proceed. Uh, yes, that's a very loaded uh, question, obviously. And um, funding or financing is always a big issue. And uh, if you, I'm not sure whether you're aware, but uh, La Mata gets most of his um, funding from the state treasury itself. So we've had uh, international development partners over the years, especially the World Bank uh, and the African Development Bank. We have implemented two urban transport projects under the auspices of World Bank to improve uh, transport services. Currently, we have a, a four-year um, called the Lagos Strategic Transport Master Plan project with the AFD where we're also developing uh, a lot of corridors. So what we've done at La Mata is to establish the foundations, have a master plan. Uh, we've also have a defined bus route network now, so that that means that we can have organized transport in every nook and corner of the city, as, long as, as well as the bus traffic transit. So we, uh, <coughs> Lagos is a construction zone right now, mainly because of what La Mata is doing. Uh, there are two rail projects that are ongoing, the blue line and the red line. We have six planned rail lines for Lagos State, and two of the most important are currently being developed. Um, we hope that by the end of the year, or at the latest, so at the first quarter of next year, we'll have those two rail lines operating. The blue line and red line, they will move well over two million passengers daily, combined, or if not more. So we are involved in a lot of mass transit projects. We also have um, two bus traffic transit networks right now, which are the main public transport corridors to move people. Uh, uh, we're trying to develop more. We have about 14 of them in our master plan. So we are making efforts to develop more. But we have this, what we call this quality bus corridors, which uh, are a function of what we have in our bus route network. So people, the, they are more or less feeder routes into the main uh, bus public transport corridor. Uh, under the AFD project, we are developing about with the I. Sorry to uh, sorry, I, I I missed that one thing. The Lagos, the current project we are implementing, the Lagos Street uh, Strategic Master Plan project, has a um, combination of AFD funding and, and as well as IFC financing. We are developing about twelve quality bus corridors within our bus route network so that people can move seamlessly into the major um, uh, bus traffic transit. So the whole idea is to develop public transport, develop non-motorized transport, so people can start leaving their cars and all these emissions can be significantly reduced. Uh, we still got a long way to go, but that is what we, that's what the plan is all about. As long as we get uh, rapid transit on, uh, systems on, uh, even though right now, because there's two stages, let me break this in. Right now, we're still using fossil fuels with our public transport. Uh, the first was to develop the systems themselves. But as we develop the systems, we intend to transit, obviously, from fossil fuel based uh, <clears throat> sources to more uh, sustainable sources like electric mobility, CNG compressed natural gases and things like that. But it's going to take uh, um, a kind of um, sort of a transition. Uh, that's why all these studies are being conducted right now. So at the end of the day, with, the, with rapid transit systems 
and non motorized transport, we intend to push Lagos beyond these problems of congestion, the problems of um, greenhouse gas emissions and all that. We intend to reduce it significantly. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> this will take some time, but we're already at it. Right now, our public transport um, network is almost entirely road based. That is, that's how we met it almost 95% route based. So we, we, we need to reduce that drastically and ensure that rail, ferry services, and other uh, modes become much more operational. And that way, we will start to get uh, cleaner, uh, we'll improve uh, uh, the health of our citizens, we'll improve the livelihood of our citizens, improve the quality of life of our citizens. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Shitabi. And I think that's that's perfect to get the next question that I have, which is regarding the equity of, of financing, right? And really making sure that the, the the financing is reaching the most vulnerable communities and, and that we're able to impact those that uh, will be affected by climate change. So Dr. Khalil, building on, on what Mr. Shitabi said, we know that climate financing is critical and it is imperative to ensure the equity of this financing um, so that climate finance and policy commit commitments are explicitly designed to allow African cities to move in better ways. So with your extensive experience in working with the international sustainable development community and international financial institutions, how can both sides, African countries and the international institutions, strengthen their collaboration to effectively and equitably support Africa's sustainable and low carbon development? Over to you, Dr. Hong. Yes, thank you. This is a very good uh, question. <clears throat> and uh, actually, uh, this already uh, ha happening uh, because uh, both sides, uh, the international financial uh, institutions and the African uh, countries have uh, the same interest. So I can uh, give you uh, my experience uh, over uh, the last five years, for example. Most of the funded uh, project uh, raised the importance and uh, priority of the sustainable uh, low carbon or decarbonization development. And uh, most of the uh, donors like World Bank, uh, USAID, SIDA, DANIDA, GIZ, and the European Union, all of them put uh, the uh, decarbonization uh, and sustainable uh, low carbon transportation and the e mobility on the uh, top uh, priorities uh, of their uh, project. The question now or the challenge how we can use this money uh, with a good planning and uh, to avoid redundancy and uh, to avoid uh, mistangibility of this project. This is that uh, of the e-mobility project. This is actually the challenge because uh, always uh, planning uh, and um, have a good and proper planning is always a challenge to move forward. This is what already we already make aligning forces and aligning effort now to uh, put the right way and uh, to start the proper and tangible in the implementation in terms of uh, time and milestones to have good uh, achievement uh, on the ground and uh, to avoid, as I said, uh, uh, unneeded and uh, untangible uh, blends uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on reality. Uh, on the other hand, uh, also most of the um, uh, government in the uh, African uh, countries are putting uh, these issues uh, on the top priority as well, but I guess they are missing uh, somehow the uh, experience uh, and capabilities because, as you know, uh, the part of planning is a very, very challengeable. Back to you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Khalid. Um, and I think those are, are excellent points. Um, and I think just to, to tie this in, in terms of aligning forces um, and, and efforts to be able to, to, um, to attain the financing, um, we've heard a lot from, from Ethiopia about uh, how they've sort of mobilized um, the energy sector and the transport sector when it comes to electric mobility. Um, and we know it takes strong collaboration and coordination among stakeholders to be able to, to move the needle, and it can't be done by one organization alone. So, Mr. Fitzumberhans Agai, if you can share your experiences in working across 
different with and uh, across and with different ministries and stakeholders on the area of cleaner mobility and what are some of the the, the lessons you'd like to share with with the panel and the audience thank you Iman, again i mean uh, as i explained earlier after putting up uh, the issue of sustainable mobility in general and especially focusing on the electric mobility in particular uh, what we have done as a ministry is that as you know the issue of the transport sector doesn't start and end at one ministry alone. It engages or it is required to engage multi agencies. Uh, it's an issue of uh, different government line departments. For example, we would need the support and engagement of the customs authority where they are responsible for determining the duty tax and other related issues. We would need the support of our national bank to access uh, foreign currency as well. And we would need the support of the Ministry of Finance to get some incentive package and others. The Ministry of Water and Energy is also required because it requires a dedicated form of uh, renewable energy from the national grid. And others would require the issue, the, 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 the academia to support the, the research and development activities. So in order to combine all these dots and to bring everyone together and to achieve the vision which we have set out, uh, which is establishing a sustainable integrated multimodal transport system in our country, there is a need for a close coordination and collaboration among different government and the private and other stakeholders, including non-governmental organizations and the private sector. So what we have done is we have created a platform which we call it an electric mobility stakeholder engagement platform, which includes all relevant stakeholders from the different uh, stakeholder groups represented from the academia, from the private sector, from the government and others. So that all will be sitting together, defining the objectives and also mm -hmm. the planning together and uh, working out together so that we will achieve the intended outcome as far as the sustainable mobility is concerned. Just to mention some of the, uh, the earlier outcomes, uh, as I explained, in order to adopt uh, electric vehicles, there is a need for incentive mechanism, both for the infrastructure as well as for the, uh, for the vehicles, and also for the consumers and as well as for the automotive industry who are either assembling or importing the vehicles. So by closely working with these stakeholders and closely engaging with the Minister of Finance, now we are completing a very good incentive mechanism for which will be used to attract more investment for the adoption of electric vehicle in terms of uh, uh, assembly, as well as in terms of setting up charging infrastructure, and as well as to make the price more competitive so that we'll have more uh, duty taxes levied or removed uh, and the better adoption will be enhanced. So we are doing aggressively with our stakeholders to realize this vision. Uh, back to you, Iman. Thank you, Mr. Zagai. So I, I think that the, the need to work with different ministries and uh, stakeholders and having these sort of platforms that bring together the stakeholders, I think, is, is a great uh, tool that can be used um, um, across uh, different countries and cities that are on, the, on a similar path. Um, so uh, just uh, to go to Mr. Jafar Saluhi, um, if you can tell us about um, your experience uh, in the collaboration between African countries and international partners in supporting climate friendly transport sector growth. And specifically, if there's a certain stakeholder group that your organization and Morocco, um, the Ministry of Transport of Morocco, is engaging and mobilizing. So it could be private sector, it could be academia. Um, but if there's a, 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 trans a stakeholder group that, that you'd like to highlight, what type of engagement you've had? Uh, with them. First of all, I would like to answer how I see the collaboration between the African countries and the international countries in order to support uh, growth and the development of the transport sector, which needs to be in line with the climate goals. I think uh, our African continent needs to follow the international dynamism and integrate into it uh, in 
the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions and uh, we have a role to play. We need to establish uh, services, transport services, we, which are more accessible to people with special needs, uh, people that have uh, reduced mobility, elderly persons that serve as uh, transport services with larger levels of flexibility and which are affordable to everybody. So what we can do here, we can create an environment which is uh, supportive to these different initiatives, which uh, uh, is in line with the existing systems that need to be slowly replaced. And governance is very important in this sector uh, to do in a way that we have an equilibrium, a balance between the different social, energetic, climatic, uh, environmental and economic factors. So we need to have the institutional framework which is flexible and able to adapt and to support the different uh, profound transformations that we see in this transport sector, especially in order to clarify the different responsibilities, the sharing of uh, responsibilities between the different actors in the field. We know that the transport sector in Morocco, for example, uh, the governance of that sector is is uh, uh, shared between different ministries. It's the urban development uh, department, then the Ministry of the Interior, then uh, the transport ministry, which is in charge of urban uh, environment, transport, etc. So we need to combine the energies and efforts to use the synergies of the different entities that are involved in order to evolve in the same direction. When it comes to projects, uh, here we need budgets, budgets that are adapted and big budgets, uh, as well as human resources that are well trained in order to fulfill the different objectives. So that's what we need in order to set up this um, sustainable uh, transport sector. So we need to, to align the different uh, activities and we need to establish the prerequisites for uh, achieving our objectives. And for that reason, it is crucial for the African countries among themselves to cooperate and to coordinate their action and efforts in order to work together and join forces to really achieve the objectives of the Paris Agreement and uh, to use the financial support that is available uh, to that end. So that uh, is important uh, for the area of adaptation of the transport sector, which normally needs uh, higher investments than the area of uh, projects that we see in the field of mitigation, uh, which are usually actions of uh, capacity building or activities around uh, technical assistance to put into place certain projects. What is also needed is that we get inspiration from best practice examples, initiatives that have already been launched in other more developed countries and that uh, help us to follow, help us to follow the good uh, practices of uh, countries that are better developed and more aware of the needs. So, we need resilient and sustainable transport systems and we need help from outside to achieve this. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Jafar Saluhi. So I think these are these are great examples from national level, and I think the importance of having flexible and resilient institutions and government structures is very critical. Um, and, and as Minister Mogus had said in, in the opening speech, that uh, our world is continuously changing, and especially cities and urban areas are very dynamic. So our institutions need to be able to adapt and, and respond to these needs um, and, and, and the urgency of, of, of climate change. So uh, moving on to 
to to the local uh, and city level. Um, Mr. Shitabe, um, if I could invite you to maybe speak from uh, from a local local government perspective, um, and what policies and measures can and should national governments use to support cities in shaping their mobility systems? So uh, a lot of the panelists here are from the national level, and I think it would be great to hear from from the local city level uh, experience. And if there's any questions or requests that uh, or recommendations that you have for the panelists, please do share that with us. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, obviously, um, this is um, uh, La Mata, Lagos Metropolitan Area Transport Authority. Obviously, we'll work from the state level. That's, I mean, um, obviously there's a national and then there's a local level be below us. We operate on the state level. We try to implement in the government's transport sector policy and strategy, hopefully, which is bringing fruits. But an important aspect of implementation has always been what I'll call ground zero, the local level. That's where you actually implement policies. And uh, the experience in Lagos has been tough. It's been really tough because prior to 2000, when this new civilian government came in and established La Mata, everything was just completely disorganized. We had um, a completely absent organized public transport system. You had a system whereby for at least three, dec three decades, there has been no organized public transport. The last time that was under the old colonial system that was handed over to, to us. And from 1980 to 2006, there was no semblance of any kind of organization in our public transport system. And everything was just disjointed. So one of the key things, one of the things that obviously we uh, one of the key elements of our transport sector strategy is to always involve the stakeholders in the development process. And that goes from up to down. The local governments are paramount to what we are doing. And without their cooperation, we are not going to get the job done. There's so much going on there. Um, when it comes to implementing the systems, we often get issues regarding the locals. Because when people are already used to certain ways of doing things, they don't want to change it. So it's a whole reform process that we are putting together here. I'll give you a quick example. We've developed the NMT policy and the governor approved it in 2019. But when we, when we started to implement the pilot scheme, for example, we experienced all kinds of problems at that level. So what we are doing is to enlighten, gather people together, stakeholders together, we have stakeholder engagements and consultations. We try to talk to the locals and let them realize that what we are trying to do is to improve the quality of life for everybody. So it's always been a challenge for us here, but uh, we are doing our very best to make sure that we we integrate them in every single thing we're doing. Because at the end of the day, the, the projects are for them. And um, they just, uh, we just, we continue to seek their co the, the cooperation at the local level at all times. So, yeah. And in terms of um, reaching out to um, some of these um, stakeholders, do our very, very best by making sure that we conduct all these um, um, engagements and talking through them in every respect. I mean, Lagos State, we have about we have about 57 local governments in Lagos State. So it's quite big and uh, each has its own peculiar problems. Um, we have issues whereby those in the localities have constituted stumbling blocks to some of the things we're doing. We've got markets, for example, 
located in the wrong places because street um, traders conducting their business on sidewalks and contributing to deteriorating the environment. So it's a whole reform process that we're going through here and uh, we'll continue to strive that. The good news is that we always have the, uh, the, the political championship. There's, there, we have some issues when it comes to, um, for example, there's a big challenge of transiting from the informal sector to the formal sector. The informal sector probably still dominates, probably 90% of the buses are still being controlled by the informal sector. So we're just gradually you know, reducing that space. Uh, under this current AFD project we have for four years, we will soon commence the informal to formal um, transition studies. This is going to be very important in ensuring that we can implement our projects at the local level. And it's going to be it's actually very challenging, very complicated. There are no fixed answers. So hopefully the studies will come up with all kinds of solutions to how we can do this, uh, how we can gradually face out the old buses, uh, how we can gradually put in new bus systems and integrate those that are already the Nigerian you know, road travel workers who are a big stakeholder in what we are doing. A lot of things have to be reformed regarding their operations and how they're going to integrate with what we are doing in terms of uh, the public transport reforms that we are implementing. So it's a serious challenge. So we're looking up, we're looking forward to this study. It's going to be key to what we're doing. Uh, like I said, we have a bus route network and everything has been compatibilized, but we need the output of this study so that we can gradually start to um, fully get the full benefits of implementing clean urban transport, because that's the whole idea. Getting rid of the old buses who are contributing more to the emissions that we have and putting in mass rapid transit buses. And then from there, we'll obviously try and shift to uh, the e-buses. Like I said, the World Bank has been here. We're working on that also, where we can start using um, electric buses and also compressed national gas. Okay, so it's been a challenge so uh, implementing projects on the local level, but we're we're up to it. Thank you. Okay, great. Yeah, I think those are insights because you're you're operating on the ground and closer to what's happening on the ground. Um, I think that these are these insights are very helpful to to those that are working at the national level as well. Um, so I think there's there's a question and a very interesting question from the audience, and I think very much related to the the challenges uh, on the ground, which is very much related to the issue of informality. So um, the question is, how can African governments deal with people's aspira aspirations to own a car? Um, should they try to change this aspiration or catalyze it towards more sustainable forms of motorization, uh, like electric cars? Uh, so anyone uh, from the panel that wants to take on this question, as we know, this is this is an issue across all the, the countries that we're operating. Um, but uh, aspiration of cars and it being a, a, re a value for a lot of people and an investment. Um, so who would like to, to tap this question first? Well, um, just quickly, obviously what we're trying to do in Lagos is encourage rapid transit encouraging people to drop their cars. So if you provide enough uh, alternative solutions for public transport and the systems that they're working, uh, good buses, high capacity buses, first and last mile buses, you develop your sidewalk system where I think people will understand and uh, will rather take that choice. It's not easy getting people to not drive their cars. But we are saying that once we develop the mass rapid integrated mass rapid transit systems, then people sh would, should drop their cars. And I'm sure they would in Lagos. You can see that already from the organized system that we provided in the limited corridors we've been able to provide them. People have actually dropped their cars. So we're trying to replicate this whole process statewide now. When you have um, you got your, your bus terminals, your routes, your interchanges and things like that. People will use public transport and de emphasize the use of public cars. And even for those using public cars right now, by the time we moved into e electric uh, mobility and CNG, they will use it also. So for us in Lagos, it's developing the infrastructure 
for public transportation and non-motorized transportation. If you do that effectively and you cover as we move um, from the pilot to a larger scheme and statewide, then that would encourage people to drop their private vehicles. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shatavi. Yes. Go ahead, okay. Mr. Uh, okay, thank you, ma'am. I think uh, it's pretty much similar with uh, City of Lagos. The policy direction where we are heading, according to our transport policy and other sub-sector policies and strategies is uh, we don't encourage private vehicle ownership and motorization as such. Uh, so what we're trying to shift is to use to more sustainable modes of transport, similar, such as the public transport options with more advanced features and also require necessary infrastructures for it so that we'll have a seamless kind of mode and integration among different sustainable modes of transport. We try to encourage the use of uh, light, rail, uh, light railway systems across the major cities. And more importantly, what we'd like to encourage is to use uh, non-motorized transport options, such as walking and cycling, by uh, availing the necessary infrastructures and also by availing the necessary tools to accommodate such needs. Thank you, Mr. Pitsum Berhan. Um, so uh, I, I, let me go to, to, the, to the question around COP, but uh, um, if there's any additional points from Mr. Jafar or Dr. Khalil, please uh, do include it in, in the final sort of wrap up. But I think the, there's a common consensus that it's really looking at um, providing options and, and really allowing people to make the choice, right? Instead of uh, forcing them or, um, but putting the right incentives in place, the right infrastructure. Uh, and it's not necessarily the ownership of, of having a vehicle that's the issue, but that as people move around, especially in urban areas, that they have the, the public transport and, and non-motorized transport options uh, to, do, to do that. Uh, so I think we have had a very interesting discussion. Um, we've had a wealth of information and insight from the different panelists. So just to sort of a, a wrap up of the session, um, let me ask the final question on, on COP27, because this is really in, in preparation to, to what's happening in, in the next uh, you know six months. And uh, to just hear from all of you, your aspirations uh, for the type of outcomes you want to see. Um, and let me start with Dr. Khalil first, uh, because you are a member of Egypt's COP27 committee. So in, in a briefing for this panel, you said that this COP will be a COP for action and implementation. So if you could elaborate on what this means for the Egyptian presidency and the international community. Over to you, Dr. Khalil. Yes, thank you, uh, Iman, and my uh, colleague for uh, this very fruitful discussion, uh, which really uh, uh, lead us to uh, the uh, ultimate goal of the next CAP 27, uh, which will be uh, an uh, action oriented. It will be a CAP for action. And uh, now all the national and international stakeholders have the same attitude. Uh, because one of the most serious challenges uh, we uh, had in the previous uh, CAPS is the uh, missing of a clear and serious commitment along with a tangible and uh, realable action plan. Uh, therefore, in, in this CAP 27, we determined and <coughs> very focused uh, that we will uh, shooting to set uh, the right policy framework and regulation uh, uh, to uh, have an uh, action and with a corresponding time frame. Uh, uh, also, we will address the challenges of the uh, financing, because as uh, most of the colleagues and you mentioned, the financing is a challenging issue, financing tools, financial mechanism, and uh, different uh, resilient uh, business model to uh, fit the purpose of, uh, of financing. So therefore, for this cup now, we have a very uh, condensed and intensive meeting with different stakeholders from all over the world and for the uh, different uh, committee and member to discuss how we uh, bring CAB uh, to be uh, an action-oriented uh, uh, conference and to have uh, some uh, tangible and uh, precise determined action on the ground. 
actually this challenge is not only for the Egyptian, but also for the, our <coughs> friends and uh, colleagues from uh, different uh, African company and worldwide. Because as you know, uh, it's all about money by the end. And most of the, uh, um, uh, the African developing country have minimal uh, contribution in this greenhouse gases and this uh, pollution. And the most contribution has come from the big companies, big industrial companies, uh, which already have a rule to pay back uh, this, uh, this money for helping the developing uh, countries through agencies and through don donors to fulfill uh, this green transformation and what we call decarbonization or uh, low uh, carbon uh, different uh, project, not only in uh, transport, but also in industry and uh, other uh, resources of uh, transforming to uh, green uh, technology. So uh, our uh, ultimate goal now we focused on how <coughs> we bring this action, what will be our plans on the immediate and short and medium uh, long uh, and the medium and long uh, uh, term, uh, how we can uh, join uh, forces as we discussed and uh, 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 organize among ourselves to uh, achieve uh, this. Back to you, Iman. Thank you, Dr. Khalil, and thank you for, for setting the bar high. So let me go to Mr. Jafar Saluhi, and um, if you can tell us from the perspective of Morocco, um, how can COP27 become an opportunity for Africa, and how would you like to see African stakeholders engage? As Dr. Khalil already said, uh, five years after the <coughs> Marrakesh COP, uh, Egypt will again be host to a COP on the African continent. And this will be an occasion, an opportunity to develop in those areas uh, where we see that the different partners have already committed themselves in the framework of uh, the Paris Agreement, especially when it comes to financing that was promised to put into place projects uh, where the different nations uh, committed themselves to co-financing our activities. And we need to be more active here when it comes to the energy transition. And the answer uh, to the climate change must be found together. <laughs> I think these are, uh, this is what is at stake, basically, where we, uh, as uh, countries of the entire planet, need to stand together, join forces in order to really fight against climate change and mitigate climate change. Thank you very okay, much. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Jafar. Um, over to you, Mr. Shetabe, um, to, and let us hear from you and from the perspective of, of Lagos. Well, uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, I'll say that um, we all need to work very hard to see to the fact that we fight climate change. It's a big problem, it's a worldwide problem, but we all have to do our bits in our respective cities, in our respective localities, and in our respective national governments worldwide. Um, it's not um, a problem for just one country, it's a problem for Africa, it's a problem for the whole world. Uh, I think we know clearly that most of the world's um, greenhouse gas emissions come from, comes from the industrial west, there's no doubt about that. They have much more industries and all that. Uh, we may not have gotten to that point yet, but it might be an opportunity for us to reverse our own policies, right, and start, you know, um, providing low emitting technologies. How are we going to do that in our various uh, engineering and manufacturing designs? How do you provide low emitting technology? Now, this is not easy because I know there's a lot of politics and economics involved in saying this. Uh, but since Africa is seen as being somewhat behind <laughs> those industrial countries, we don't need to follow their path, do we? We can cut our own path and start you know, doing things in a sustainable way. And um, if we can do that, I think, the, I think the African Union should come together and come, come up with a comprehensive uh, 
environmental, climatic, and transport policy that would encourage low carbon energy transport throughout Africa. That's basically what we should be doing. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Shitabe. Um, over to you, Mr. Fitzubunhan. Uh, I'll be very quick uh, on this, uh, Iman. As the previous speakers mentioned, uh, Africa has hosted uh, similar uh, COP events in the past. Uh, one in South Africa, very recently in Morocco, Marrakesh, which I also had the privilege of attending, and now the upcoming COP in Egypt. Uh, under the Egypt's presidency is the one which we are very hopeful of as far as the world, the entire world is concerned. And uh, we are expecting a lot. And as uh, my, my, my brother Khalid mentioned, it's expected to be the COP of action. And uh, let's hope that uh, meaningful action uh, is being taken in this COP uh, so that we revert the, all the issues which have been under discussion in the, in the last 27, 26 COPs, I would say and have a very meaningful hope uh, to be upheld uh, in, in Egypt because we have been discussing the last hour or so that shifting to sustainable modes of transport requires a lot of investment. It's very capital in, in, intensive. And uh, as a developing world in general and as Africa in particular, we don't have those, the luxury of those resources to adopt to such kinds of technologies and there is a need developing world to really uh, mm -hmm. finance uh, uh, and also uh, ask, uh, provide the necessary technology for the developing world for better adaptation and mitigation of uh, the climate impact. And finally, I hope uh, this uh, upcoming COP, as it's being hosted in Africa, will be a place where all African countries will join hands for a meaningful uh, action. That's what I can say. Thank you, Mr. Um, okay. I think that uh, we have about two minutes left, so I think that I couldn't have said it better. Um, this has been an incredible session. Thank you to all the panelists and speakers and the audience for tuning in. I've definitely been inspired by this panel and hope COP27, like most of you have said, could be the turning point, uh, especially for Africa, and, and really be you know, a COP of action, of meaningful action, of, sy of system change, of proper planning, um, of, of really aligning forces and efforts, of having uh, flexible institutions and governance structures of tackling informality and other challenges on the ground, um, of achieving the energy transition, of really coming together and, and having very creative and innovative financing and bus uh, financing mechanisms and business models that will really help us uh, uh, build cities that, that are green and um, that are low carbon and really avoid what some of the, the mistakes that have been done by many other countries. Um, with leaders and experts such as those on this panel, I really believe that is possible. And with that, I would like to close this session and 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 thank you all once again and wish you a great day thank you very much thank you thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, thank you very much nice thank you